Okay, hello there, welcome. Uh, very nice to have you with us. We are now back inside off the beach in our little kind of staff area here in our main fieldwork centre and uh, hopefully we'll get some peace and quiet and I'll be able to talk you through a range of different uh, stages and, and things that we need to cover to give you a bit more of an understanding, a bit more confidence about the NEA process. If you hear any squawking, any kind of strange noises in the background, that's not my stomach. It's uh, the seagulls that we have outside the window at the moment. They're quite uh, quite lively, probably after some chips, I thought. So to get us started, I think it's useful just to address this acronym. Uh, it's probably the term that your teachers will use already or maybe in the future to uh, to speak about your coursework. We call it the NEA in geography and the NEA stands for non-examined assessment. I know they call that it probably the same in history and science and, and English and other subjects as well. So it's a non-examined piece of work this but it is obviously an assessed piece of work because we have 20% of your final geography mark and initially it will be marked by your teachers and then quite probably it will be sent away and externally assessed by a set of examiners too and you will ultimately get a grade which is then translated into a percentage and goes against your final geography mark. Okay, so in addition to how much the NEA is worth, this is a slide that just looks at some of the other essentials that is worth being aware of and considering. That second box there says there's a guide of 4,000 words. So at this point in time, you probably haven't got too much of an idea about the scale and the size of what you're being asked to do. And 4,000 words might sound like a lot, but it isn't really a lot. And you can very easily write that amount of, um, of text. Generally, I would say that most of the NEAs that I have marked have been around about five to 6,000 words over the last few years. And it's useful to know then that there is no penalty for exceeding that 4,000 word guide. Some students will quite comfortably write more than 6,000 words, but I would say if you're writing way in excess of, uh, of that amount, then you're probably in danger of waffling and repeating yourself. And there'll be many students that need to kind of rein themselves in a little bit just to make sure that what they are putting down is quality over quantity. Next box there says it needs to link to the spec. So this is obviously a crucial thing. You can do your NEA on anything. It's up to you what you do it on, but it does have to be relevant to the current geography curriculum. So to find out what that is, you can either look on the, uh, the actual specification for your exam board on their website, or you could just pick up their latest exam uh, textbook, which you'll no doubt have in your classrooms if you've got access to one. And you can then flick through that to get an idea and refresh yourselves about the themes and the, the things that are covered in um, that textbook and therefore in the curriculum. And finally, um, the NEA, the essential thing that all exam boards agree on is that it needs to be unique to you. It needs to be designed and conducted, developed and completed by you because this is the key thing. The exam boards want this to be an independent investigation, different to GCSE when you were told what to do and where to do it. This is your own investigation. And even though you might be studying the same issue or maybe even the same case study or place as one of your friends, that's fine. And it's probably inevitable if you're in a big school that there'll be other people doing a similar thing to you. The important thing is that you can show that your study is unique to other people's and that your kind of ideas and the way that you've developed your NEA is unique to you. And it's not just a carbon copy of somebody else. And it's not um, something that you've just been told to write. So it needs to be your own independent investigation. Again, at this point, um, it might be difficult to grasp what we're asking you to do in terms of writing a geographical report. A few years ago at GCSE, students were able to, well, I say able, but students had to complete um, a GCSE field studies project. But you guys, when you did your GCSE, that wasn't a requirement. So you have actually come into A-level without any real experience of developing your own geography reports unless you've done it in year seven, eight or nine. So it is quite difficult at this point to picture what it is that your teachers are asking you to do. But one of the things that you will have in your favour, certainly um, against students that are maybe two or three years older than you, is that you're not the guinea pigs. The guinea pig years were years that came two or three years ago. And um, they will have completed their NEAs and your teachers will probably somewhere have a box in the cupboard of their old NEA project. So one of the things you could do when you're next in school is you could perhaps ask to have a look at some of the previous NEAs that have been completed, just so you've got a bit of an idea about the size, the scale, the way they look, the way they're structured, 
about you know what a geography report looks like now I'm going to show you this um, overview this is by no means to say this is how an NEA should look um, but this is just kind of like a screen capture of somebody's NEA which I um, I was kind of um, overseeing a few years ago and one of the things that I liked about it was the color most geography teachers most people that do geography really are secret closet coloring in you know fans we love a bit of color uh, we love maps we love <laughs> we love pictures uh, graphics things like that and what I would say at this point when I get on my soapbox here is I would say that geography and geography reports should look different to your standard English essay or history piece of coursework you don't want to open a geographical report and just see pages and pages of white uh, paper with black text on it a geography report has got the opportunity to include color to include lots of visual assets like maps and images and one of the things that you should try to be thinking of is bringing your issue to life and bringing your report to life ultimately I would perhaps try and picture that examiner who might well be the person that's overseeing the mark that you have been given and they may have been sent a stash of 250 different NEA projects they might have a whole box of them next to their desk and they're working through them and can you imagine them when they put yours on their table and they open it up and they just see it's a big thick pile of paper with just black and white text on it subconsciously their heart might sink and they might think oh god that's a lot of reading I've got to get through here well you can bring it to life add a bit of color and variety and creativity to it by making it look like a modern professional geographical report and if you click on any kind of council or generally lots of organizations on their websites will produce annual reports uh, various different kind of publications and they'll have them as kind of free downloadable pdfs they'll include these things like infographics and maps and stuff like that have a look at what modern reports look like they don't necessarily have to be modern geographical reports but have a look what you know organizations like the council or various different kind of companies are producing they often as i say produce these annual reports have a look how they're structured and maybe try to be a bit creative about how you structure yours and how you make it look doesn't just as i say have to be white pages of black and white text black text not white okay so this next slide here is um, a way in which we've tried to split up and make clear the different stages that you need to think about when you're designing your geography study basically you can split up a geography study into three different parts the before the during and the after and the before bit is the bit that we're going to help you out with those are the bits that are listed there one to six in that yellow box basically this is the planning stage the bits that you need to think about before you start completing your fieldwork there'd be no good just turning up to a shopping center with a clipboard and starting to count people willy-nilly and uh, to ask people questions about what the shopping center was like before you've got to plan it you've got to think what am I going to do and why am I doing it so the first thing that you need to do your first challenge really is to make probably the hardest decision of them all and, and to kind of come up with the actual issue or topic that you're going to do your study on now that is tricky and uh, we'll have a video where we try and help you with that um, but I would say that at this stage and I'll repeat it down the line as well that one of the things you should try to do is to make sure that that issue is one of the things that you're interested in one of the parts of geography that you actually like and that you don't mind finding out a bit more about and doing more work on with that in mind the second thing that you should do once you've decided on your issue is to start researching it to start to find out more about it who's spoken about it who's done work on it where has it affected places before and we would call this your initial research to build towards something called your literature review literature review and you would use this research in your introduction to show as much as you can about your understanding of your topic or your issue and it might well be that you can use this newly found understanding to drive the aim and the titles and maybe the hypotheses that you later set and it might well be that you're trying to prove whether this issue is having a similar impact in your own locality so I would put rather than having it first I would put your aim and title and setting that as the third thing that you do on your kind of list of requirements when planning your fieldwork some people might say you do that first surely but I would do it third after you've done your research and you found out about what that issue is and the impacts that it often creates 
after that, number four, uh, this is kind of goes hand in hand with your um, title and your aims, but we often then divide up our um, investigations into smaller, more manageable chunks. And we call these sub questions. Again, there'll be a video that explains how you can use sub questions to support your, your investigation. And uh, that will be something that is covered in more detail later. Number five, um, having picked your title and chosen the direction of it and the uh, aims and the ambitions and sub questions of it, you then need to think about what methods of data collection you're going to use to actually gather information. Are you doing an investigation that actually allows you to gather uh, information? So you need to think about how am I going to get a, how am I going to get information to help me answer this question? Now knowledge of data collection methods amongst students is often quite limited because normally at GCSE you may have only done perhaps three or four different methods of data collection. If you've been to the beach, some of you might have done things like beach profiles or testing the, the strength and direction of longshore drift. Some of you might have done uh, pedestrian counts, traffic counts, environmental quality surveys, questionnaires, things like that. But there are heaps and heaps of extra methods of data collection techniques that you can also consider. And one of the things that we're going to try and do is, is to increase your knowledge of those different methods. Finally, when you have chosen your title, you've found out um, about the different methods and you've allocated the methods of data collection that you're going to use, then you need to think about actually designing your fieldwork. So it will be up to you to then design your day's fieldwork or your two days fieldwork that you actually complete. And you'll go out with your clipboards and any equipment that you need, and you'll need to have a bit of a plan as to what you do, where you go, how long you're timing for, what equipment you're using, what questions you're asking, what sampling techniques you're considering. All of those things are going to be up to you. And that number there, number six, although it's only three words, design your fieldwork, it looks quite simple. And it is, but there's lots of things that you need to think about to make sure that you're designing your fieldwork so you're completing good fieldwork and it's going to help you writing up your NEA at a later stage. OK, so those will be in the later videos.